Well, good morning. Welcome back to worship this morning here at Lighthouse. I am so glad that you've decided to join us today. Whether you're here in our sanctuary at home, um, joining us online, welcome. Welcome to all of you. Well, today we're in week three of our sermon series, and if my sweater is any indication, this series is entitled Ugly Christmas Sweater. So far, we've talked about how during this Christmas season, it should be the most wonderful time of the year. But we also said that many of us end up with ugly thoughts and actions and words that can hurt the people around us. And we started with a warning about ugly thoughts, right? We cautioned ourselves from allowing ugly thoughts to fester and to become ugly, into ugly words and ugly actions. And instead, we learned from the Apostle Paul to think about other things, right? At the end of the letter to the Philippians, we read this. One final thing, Paul says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then last week, we learned about ugly words. Our words are interesting, aren't they? I mean, with the same tongue in our mouth, we can bless the Lord and curse the people that he has made in his image. Whoa. This is what James writes about in his letter, talking about the tongue, which is just a small part of our bodies, but can do a tremendous amount of harm. We learned, about, we learned from Jesus ab about all that is in our hearts, right? Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, a good person produces good things from a treasury of a good heart, and an evil produce person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. So what you say flows from what is in your heart. So today we want to talk about ugly motives and how they can hinder our relationships and harm our witness to the world. You know, ugly motives may not at first seem to be ugly. Sometimes our motives can seem good or right in our own eyes, but then upon further reflection, we can see them for what they really are. Lisa and I, we used to have this dog named Buster. Buster was a Cocker Spaniel and he was awesome. He was super happy and fun and energetic. And he was also part goat. Um, he would eat things that should just not be eaten. I remember one time he, he ate Lisa's sandals. I don't mean that he chewed up Lisa's sandals. I mean he ate them. Everything was gone except for a tiny piece of the rubber sole. The rest was all in his tummy. He ate glass Christmas ornaments. He also drank our coffee if we weren't watching. Anyway, we had Buster when we were house parents and um, we had our son Joe and then eight other uh, teenage boys in our house. And so Buster, he just loved all of that activity. But then our jobs changed, and, and Lisa and I were no longer house parents, and our son, Joe, he moved to Colorado, and so it was just Lisa and myself and Buster. And he, and he got really depressed. He really did. And we came to the understanding that Buster needed children. And so we had heard about this family that was burdened financially. It took uh, they had just bought this house, and it took all the money that they had to get into the house. And so they were going into Christmas with no gifts for their three little children and one teenager. And so they were going to have to tell the kids that, hey, the house is your present. That doesn't really sell to like a six-year-old, right? Um, so we gave them Buster, and they had a Merry Christmas. And, uh, and this, is not, this is not the ugly motives part of the story. It's coming up. So we had no dog for like three months. We had moved into this apartment in West Omaha. We lived on the third floor of a four-story apartment building. And at the same time, we were having a house built from scratch in Elkhorn, Nebraska, which is a suburb a little bit of ways away. And Lisa, she wanted us to wait until we moved into our home before getting a new dog. I was impatient. Now, you need to know that Lisa's birthday is on March 28th. So I had found this little dog named Nigel and uh, from the Little White Dog Rescue that I got for Lisa's birthday. And then we, 
promptly named the dog Dougie. We named the dog Dougie. Dougie was our best little fur baby for a really long time, and God really blessed us with this little guy. So it turned out okay. But my motives, they were not very good. The truth of the matter is that my motives were totally selfish. It was all about me, not anything about Lisa. My motives, as it turned out, were ugly. Now, March in Nebraska is winter. And that meant that every time that Dougie needed to go outside, we had to take him in the elevator down three floors and then outside. And every time that Lisa had to take out Dougie in the rain or the sleet or the snow, she was reminded of my ugly and selfish decision. Ugly motives. You know, each of us makes decisions in our lives based upon different motives. So it's important for us to pay attention to our motives because they can result in us blessing others or they can result in us only focusing on ourselves. The mark of a Christian is someone who's motivated by love to treat others better than themselves. We're always tempted, you know, by our sinful nature to put ourselves first. But through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the example of Jesus, we can rise above our selfish motivations. So before we begin reading our passage today, let's take a minute and we'll pray and then we'll get started. Here we go. Join with me. Jesus, our Savior, we pray with humble hearts. We come before you and recognize that sometimes we can be selfish. Sometimes we do things from impure motives or selfish motives. Sometimes we even do good things with a bad motive. Lord, we pray that you would clean up our hearts and bring purity to our motives. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. Well, during his earthly ministry, Jesus was particularly interested in people's motives and the reasons that, for what they did, the things that they did. And so Jesus knew that people's motives were really deep-seated heart issues. Our heart is where our ugly motives are given birth. And it is, like we learned last week, the source of all of the ugly words that we have. So if you're able to stand for scripture for the reading today, then let's see what Jesus has to say about ugly motives. Our passage today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Here we go. It's kind of long, so hang with it. If you need to sit down, feel free to do so. <clears throat> Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogue and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward that they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly and on street corners and in the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward that they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself and shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food that we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. That is the only reward they will get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting, except your Father, who knows what you do in private. 
And your Father who sees everything will reward you. Word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. So Jesus is speaking to a group of people who focus too much on living out the law and looking righteous in front of others. Their passion to look spiritual was more important to them than actually having healthy spirituality. And so Jesus said to them, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then he goes and gives us three examples. When you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And then he says, and when you pray, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, he said, for they love to stand on the street corner and pray in the synagogues so that they will be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full, Jesus says. And then he says, whenever you fast, don't put on a gloomy face, as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by others for their fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have all of the reward they're going to get. Now, Jesus, he's not taking issue with these actions that the individuals are doing in and of themselves. Of course, giving to the needy is a good thing, and praying is a good thing, and fasting. These are all good things, right? But Jesus is interested in the motive behind doing these things. Because you can do the right thing for the wrong reason, right? Ugly ugly motives can nullify our witness to the world. The Christmas season, it is full of opportunities to serve others and meet other people's needs. And some of these people... Uh, Some people see these opportunities as a way to receive praise for their generosity. So they drop money in the bell ringer's bucket, hoping that the ring of the coins can be heard by other people passing around, you know. Or people love to tell how they volunteered down at the soup kitchen in downtown, hoping that others will acknowledge how spiritual they are. Jesus says these folks have received all the reward they're going to get. They get the applause, they get the recognition that that they desired from other people, but that's the end of it. It seems there's a greater reward that we can receive by our willingness to serve others without needing the recognition. Rather than just getting applause for someone who serves, but somebody who serves in humility develops a character that's worth far more than the praise of people. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason can cost us our ability to grow into the person that God wants us to be. The very way in which Jesus came to us at Christmas gives us an inspiration for living life with the right motives. In Luke chapter 2, we read, At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken of the Roman Empire. This was the first census that was taken when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And so all people had to return to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem to Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth up in the north in Galilee. And he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged and was now expecting a child. And verse 6 says, And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. And so she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in snugly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room available for them. You guys kind of know the story, right? Now, if anybody deserved praise for their actions, it surely would have been God of the God of the universe becoming a human in order to rescue us. But don't miss the specific way in which Jesus came. He did not come to some castle somewhere as a king or a holy temple in the middle of the city as a priest. He came in the form of a baby in a stinky manger full of farm animals. Clearly, Jesus' motives were not for recognition or for praise. His motivation was love. The very reason that we celebrate during Christmas is because this, this divine act of humility in the birth of Jesus. 
he set for us an example and invited us to follow his lead. So Jesus is our motivation. Jesus is our motivation. An ugly Christmas sweater at any Christmas party is meant to do one thing. It is meant to draw attention to ourselves, right? When Jesus is our motivation, the deep desire within us is to draw attention to him. When we serve others, it becomes easy to say that we're doing this only because Jesus first served us. When we love others around us, it is easy to say we are doing this because Jesus first loved us. When we take the spotlight off of ourselves and place it on our Savior, the true hero, he is our true motive. Amen? There's a powerful story of motivation from college football, way back in college football. Notre Dame football star George Gipp could do it all. He could run, he could pass, he could punt with unparalleled skills. And the 1920 season established Gipp as a football star. But on December 14, 1920, young George Gipp died of pneumonia. But thanks to college football stories and a movie in which former President Ronald Reagan starred and portrayed Gipp, the story of George Gipp lives on. This is how it goes. On November 10th, 1928, Notre Dame and Army were tied at halftime in a struggle for victory. Notre Dame coach Newt Rockney, himself a legend, right, told the players of being at Gipps, uh, dying Gipps' bedside a few years before. And Rockney recalled how Gipp feebly said, sometimes, Rock, when the team is up against it, when things are going wrong and the brakes are all against, against us and they're beating the boys, tell them to go out there with all they've got and to win one for the Gipper. And they did. The Notre Dame football team was motivated to honor Gip and it inspired them to fight and to win that game. As Christians, our motivation for living life, to live this life of loving service, and a life focused on others is the death, resurrection, and life of Jesus Christ. His sacrifice motivates us to sacrifice for others as well. Jesus is our motivation. It's like Paul states in Colossians 3.23. It's one of my favorite verses. He says, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Jesus is our motivation. We're not out there to impress other people when we live righteous lives. We're out there to honor our Lord Jesus. He is our motive and our reward for doing the right thing. No more ugly motives. This Christmas, let us allow Jesus to guide our words and our actions, no matter how much we're tempted to be self-serving. Because, folks, it's not a competition. One of the reasons that we find ourselves fighting against ugly motives is because many times we find ourselves in competition for attention and accolades. Rivalry is a mentality of the world and has no place really in the heart of a Christian. Yet it can still be a core motivation, can't it? I'm reading a book on masculinity these, uh, recently and I just started it. It's called The Warrior Poet. Anyway, the author says that boys when they play, are naturally competitive. And we tend to take any activity that we're put into and turn it into an event to compete. I think the author's right. We have a fiercely competitive nature. Television has even turned cooking, something that we used to do because we love people and we want to share hospitality with them, we've turned that into a competition, right? Our faith in Jesus is not a competition. And if Jesus is our example and our motivation, well, we're going to lose anyway, right? So Paul speaks to this mentality, I think, in his passage that precedes what is known as the kenosis passage. It's also in the book of Philippians. It gives context to this section of Scripture where Paul lifts up Jesus' humble and sacrificial life as our model to follow. Anyway, this is the verse that starts that passage. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Don't be selfish. 
Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Verse 4 says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. It's not a competition. Apparently, rivalry and competition within the church is not some kind of a new issue. It finds its roots all the way back into the early beginnings. Paul knew then that there would be a desire to kind of one-up each other. And this, would, this had the potential to undo that all that Jesus had come to build and establish. And the same is true for us today. We're not in a competition with each other. Instead, we ought to cheer each other on and push each other forward out of love. When I am motivated to honor Jesus first and honor those around me second, that is the only way that we all win. Amen? Christmas sweaters with ugly motives focused on ourselves. We don't want to be that. We don't want to be an ugly Christmas sweater. Right? Every person is motivated to act by specific things in life. And the question is, what's your motivation? Sometimes we are searching for praise from people when we should be seeking praise only from God. With healthy motives, we become people who live healthy lives with healthy spirituality. So this week, I'm going to challenge you. I want to challenge you to be secret servant agents. Secret servant agents. This week, I want to invite you to choose one person out there in your life to do something kind for as a way of honoring Jesus and honoring them. But here's the key. This needs to be done anonymously. Whatever you, however you choose to bless someone, do not let them know that it was you. Allow your motivation and service to be for Jesus rather than for any kind of recognition. So maybe this means that you send an anonymous letter of encouragement, an anonymous gift card, an anonymous gift left on somebody's doorstep, or you know that somebody has a need and you just meet that anonymously. And as you're doing that, remember the words that Jesus said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Challenge your selfish motives with selfless acts for other people. So this Christmas, as we get rid of ugly thoughts and get rid of our hearts right and our motives pure, our reward is to become more like the person that God designed us to be more and more like Jesus himself. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Motives are a tricky thing, Lord, and uh, they come from good places and bad places, and, and sometimes we even do the right thing, but with the wrong motive. And so, Lord, we pray that throughout this Christmas season that we would be able to focus on you and allow you to be our motivation for doing things for people. Whether that's giving a gift, praying for somebody, helping out a need where you see it. Whatever it is, Lord, give us the right motivation. Let us set in our heart you as our example and follow diligently after that, Lord. Because even when we do good things, if we do them for the wrong motives, well, it somehow cheapens it, makes it less, corrupts it with our sin of pride and selfishness. Let us not be like an ugly Christmas sweater that only desires to draw attention to ourselves, but rather, Lord, let us put all of the attention and all of the focus and all of the light on you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.